Uh, the things we want to disclose, showing and starting uh, with methods, um, but also reflecting how we protect our sources, how we protect our research, and um, last uh, but not least, how we protect ourselves in that game. So um, I will not um, introduce lengthy the speakers. I ask them to do that themselves as um, we have only 90 minutes. Um, other than the session before, I was trying to give each, um, I was inviting each of these uh, gentlemen and gentlewomen to um, make a presentation of 10 minutes so that we have a little bit more space left for discussion and us identifying where we agree and where we disagree and where we need maybe further discussion. So, uh, MC, the floor is yours to... Yeah, oh, you want, yeah, I, you should stand there, I guess, and just, should I yes, I yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, maybe if we can get the computer on the screen. Um, oh, there's some video dudes over there, if you can. What is this? Um, hello, media team. Ah, good. Hi, so I'm MC and I work on Transparency Toolkit and we make tools to help journalists collect and analyze data. And I find the title of this panel, Protection versus Transparency, very interesting because I'm not actually sure I totally agree with that framing of it as if it's a trade-off. Oh, because I'm not sure I totally agree with that framing of it as if it's a trade-off. Because I, think trans because I think protection requires transparency. In order to protect against threats, you need to know what you are trying to protect against. So it requires that information. And one of the groups that understands this principle the best is the intelligence community. The intelligence community goes to great lengths to gather information on all of the possible threats that it might need to defend against. It goes and it collects all of our communications, all of the internet traffic, locations of people from cell phones, and then analysts take this information and use it to figure out threats, either real or imagined, and this is used to inform policymakers and military. I think that journalists are actually not so different from intelligence analysts. Journalists have a very similar role where they're trying to collect information on potential issues and understand it and synthesize it and present it, but in this case, they present it to the public rather than to policymakers or the military. So I think this similarity is something that we should embrace and try to figure out how to use in a more effective way. Unfortunately, one of the other differences that journalists have, aside from their end goal being to inform the public rather than secretly to inform policymakers and military, is that journalists have fewer resources. They don't have super expensive drones that they can fly for surveillance and killing people. They don't have the resources to intercept everyone's communications, nor should they have these things, I think, nor should the intelligence community have these things, but they have far fewer resources, they have far less money. The thing is, though, is that we, when we look at the forces that enable surveillance and enable the intelligence community to gather all of this information, they go both ways. Things like the internet, mean that everyone leaves a data trail everywhere with everything they do. And this is true of the intelligence community as well, because even people who are working on secret programs leave data trails. And one thing that we've been doing is collecting information on some of these people. So for example, this is Nicholas Binstock. He works for a company called Organizational Strategies, Inc. And one of the things he does there is he's a drone operator for Customs and Border Protection, specifically a Predator drone operator for Customs and Border Protection, flying Predator drones around the US border and talking about it on LinkedIn. This is Lauren Russell, um, another case. She decides who to kill for the uh, Joint Priority Effects List. It's an extrajudicial kill and capture list for the US military. And there are also people who are working on new friendly surveillance programs as well, like uh, Natasha Clements, who mentions many familiar programs like 
Dishfire, XKeyScore, Pinmail, Marina, and other databases, and talks about our expertise in those. Then there's uh, this person, Soli Pichaboni, who also talks about surveillance databases, but some not so familiar ones, like one called Panopticon. No idea what that is, but it sounds kind of sketchy. And another one called Never Shake a Baby, which is the strangest name I've ever heard of for a surveillance program, but it seems to appear pretty consistently. Um, so I'd like to figure out what that is. And then there are even people like Philip Brown, who used to work as an interrogator at Guantanamo and is talking about it as well publicly on the internet. So there's a wide, wide array of information available online, and this is just a small selection. We collected over 70,000 resumes of people in the intelligence community that were just publicly available on the internet. And these are just resumes. There are other data sources too. There are job listings, there are contract databases, there's social media. And I think we need to figure out ways to actually harness and use this information in ways that the intelligence community already does. Um, the intelligence community has all these resources and they put these resources into collecting all this information and then they have tools like Palantir and Analyst Notebook that they use to understand it. So why don't we try to do this too? So one of the things that we've been working on with Transparency Toolkit is making software to help collect and analyze information so that journalists can use data in the same way that intelligence analysts can. And these, this involves tools for actually collecting data from different sources online, so open source intelligence, taking data from public sources, as well as taking other data sets, like piles of PDFs, whether they're leaked documents or hacked documents or documents that were just publicly released by governments, and making the text available. Um, once we get that in one place, taking tools to match all of the information on the same entities across sources, so to link up all of the information on one person or one company and figure out the relations between them. Uh, so that we can get a comprehensive picture of each entity's role. And then tools for extracting information from data sets. So taking a document and seeing what are all the surveillance programs mentioned in this document, or what are all the locations mentioned in this document, so that that can be later be linked for analysis. And finally, tools for viewing and analyzing data. We've done this with um, IC Watch, the collection of resumes, as well as other archives like the Snowden documents and the hacking team documents, uh, so that they're easier to access and search through. And once we have this, we can start to develop a more complete, comprehensive picture of what is being done for surveillance. And that's a precondition to actually taking concrete measures to protect against surveillance. So once we know what's being done, we can figure out how we should encrypt our data, what legal actions we should take, how we should campaign. And I think the others will discuss in more detail um, some of these actions and what they might look like. But before these are possible, we need to first understand what the what is being done, and this is only possible if we start collecting all of this information in one place and coming up with better ways to go through and analyze it and explore it. Thanks. So just to um, ensure that we understand you right, you say we should first collect the information saw them and so then see what options we have for further action. Okay, thank you. I think that's an uh, interesting thought. So I would like to invite the next speaker to... Um, oh, I should probably uh, get you the right presentation. Um, so while I do that, you can introduce yourself. <laughs> okay. Um, well, first of all, thanks very much for, for having me here. Uh, I'm Richie Tynan. I'm the technologist at Privacy International. And the title of this talk has changed from various different things, but I think it's settled on a, on a very interesting one and a very good one. Um, it reminds me of a lot of the, the um, uh, so-called comparisons that have been made, for example, between privacy and security, privacy, freedom of expression, even privacy against democracy and rule of law and fair trials. Um, so, for example, in the UK, we have Laurie Love, who's potentially under a second obligation to uh, forcibly decrypt information, uh, private information that has been kept secure. And 
on the other side, as journalists, there's, there's obviously the protection of sources, and there's a protection of many things, such as client, uh, client uh, solicitor communications, that unfortunately in the UK um, are under pretty much unprecedented threat, where there's zero protections for the collection, and I use the word collection, not um, um, interception, because they have a different definition in the UK for what interception is, and it requires a person to look at it. But all of these things seem to suggest if, if rather than looking at them necessarily in, um, in opposition of each other, in fact, I think a significant number of these things actually are mutually reinforcing. And the overlap and the enabling uh, component of each individual right as it is uh, allows the enjoyment of many other rights. And so when we talk about the, the transparency versus protection debate, as I think MC alluded to uh, earlier on, I think we need to ground it in some, some facts and in some, um, some instances where we can start tease, tease out the, various, the interplay between the two, um, whether we have rights to protect our stuff, whether uh, any time we encrypt something we ought, ought to send that encryption key to our government or whether Apple should send that encryption key to governments and whether all companies should do the same so that if the government wants to get into their financial information. So it's a, it's a very difficult, um, it's a very difficult uh, uh, question to answer, especially in the abstract, but I think at the very least we should acknowledge that uh, the right to privacy and, and down through the years I found that um, depending upon the audience, the language used can often resonate differently with different people. So we've tried things like the, the privacy and security are one and the same, privacy and safety can often be one and the same, and privacy and protection can be one and the same, such that if, if uh, people are using an unsafe form of communication, that can mean the difference between life and death. Um, and I, I just I, I finish here with the, the example of a private discussion between lawyers, say between activists and lawyers discussing a potential freedom of information request to try and elicit some transparency from a government which unfortunately in the UK is trying to erode uh, freedom of information, uh, the ambit of freedom of information. So as journalists, whether you um, value protecting your information or not, uh, your adversaries certainly do. Uh, there is no doubt about this. This is the these are the photos of the um, hard or the USB sticks and uh, trackpads of the documents from the Guardian that purportedly contained uh, leaked documents from Edward Snowden. And it was alluded to earlier on uh, by Jake about the, the the act of coming in and destroying them. And they gave us a blueprint for uh, what they wanted to destroy. Uh, now, as journalists and, and protecting the, the uh, confidentiality of your sources, uh, do people destroy USB sticks the way MI5 does? Should you? Did you know that it was possible? Or did you know that it was uh, a, a potentially a requirement? But also the mo more interesting thing here is the bottom left picture is actually your keyboard, is the controller in the keyboard which they felt that if it got into the wrong hands could potentially reveal information that they didn't want revealed. Again, with your trackpad, that can contain two megabytes worth of data, and also your battery controller. So there's very little components in the devices that you use that can, um, well, according to the guys that know, uh, they feel these components would betray them, so maybe these components will betray you. Um, and there's a confession here, like a good Irish Catholic, I start off with a confession, um, <laughs> that Nothing here is, is mine, uh, and one of the things I found in relation to security and protecting information is that very few security people figure this stuff out by themselves. It's crucial to uh, be open and listen to uh, anybody and everybody because no matter how much you think you know, there is always somebody out there who knows more, and find that person or find those people, have a point with them, and hopefully assimilate the information and take on, even if you just take on board 1%, 10%, whatever that is, cumulatively over time, make yourself more secure and more protected. A lot of people implement protective measures and then further down the line, ignore them. So the purpose of this talk is that, you know, we're trying to be transparent here with friends and I'm gonna to talk to you about some of the stuff we do at PI and it's important that, that we're doing this in a transparent fashion because I don't believe in having an ego about this. If you do have an ego, you won't necessarily make yourself as secure as you could be. So if we're wrong, tell us. Or if you see something you like, ask us. 
Uh, this is not about uh, uh, creating a monopoly on information. This is creating a starting point for discussion where people can take what they want or contribute to, to, to what I'm about to present. So one of the lessons that I think has emerged from, and it follows on from the notion that you can't uh, kind of do security on your own in your own little bubble, is that it's important to learn from the mistakes of others. And by God, there's been a lot of mistakes uh, in the recent past. So usually what most people have set up is a wireless network in their office, and that is where all their traffic and all their information goes through. Or if you're lucky and you can spring for some sort of wired system, you'll connect in some servers and some desktop machines. And that's all very, very nice. The hacking team hack, usually in journal, uh, when we speak to journalists, usually a uh, hacking team is used as a, a scare tactic or the boogeyman where if your government has hacking team, then they will try to hack journalists and things like that. And um, there are very, the, the hacking team is a threat, but there are, there are other threats out there that are more uh, prevalent and that happen significantly more often. So rather than use hacking team and FinFisher as a way to try and uh, scare people, I thought it'd be interesting to try something different and try and talk about the hacks that they encountered and what, we, what you guys can do to, to, to ask some good questions. So 350 gigabytes left the hacking team office. And the question then for you is, what do you guys have in place such that if 350 gigabytes leaves your office or your home or your device, that you'll know about it? Because most of this stuff, we're not even at the level of protection. There's a lot of things like PGP, which is talking about protection, but we're not actually looking at the, the detection of when things go wrong. And there's some various different questions here. I'm not going to go through them all, but the essence of it is getting insight into what's going on on your device and on your network uh, is crucial to figure out if uh, indeed something is going wrong. In the FinFisher hack, what happened was they got in via, I think, a print function in one server and then used that as a hopping off point to go to various other different places. Roughly, that would potentially be considered a, a pivot. Um, but what do you guys have in place to prevent a machine on your, on your network or machine in your house who has been infected from then trying to infect other people. In general, there's very little reason for any two machines in your, uh, in your office or in your home to talk to each other, uh, but when they do, that might be a very good sign of something that's going wrong. And one of the questions that you might ask yourself as part of an organization or even just in your own self-interest is, how many machines try to talk to me, or if you're in part of an organization, how many machines on your network try to communicate with your executive director's machine? Because if somebody has clicked on a link, the very first person I would go after after I got into an organization would be the executive director or somebody in charge of the money. Um, we also have the Ashley Madison hack where uh, passwords were used on many different services, and that contributed to a number of accounts on uh, various different services, and arguably, well, we, we don't necessarily know this, but potentially accounts in individual organizations where they've been reused. Now, I'm posing these things as, as I'll, I'll give a potential answer slide uh, later on, hopefully if I have time, but uh, it's, it's to basically get or to, to turn this around and start asking questions, rather than focusing on necessarily tools, which there's a new cool tool every single month, tools are really the answer to a question. And it's important to ask the right questions. And the kind of questions that I'm asking here are based on the previous experiences and real life, real world hacks that have occurred. So if you can figure out what, what the, the, the general strategy is of your adversary, maybe you can start asking the questions to put in place either the protections, mitigation, or uh, preventative measures to, uh, so that you're not the next victim. Um, and as I said, these are the passwords, and password managers potentially would be a solution to this, but they're a very narrow solution that work, and that's the other issue, that tools will only work in a very narrow window, often do serve only one purpose, but unfortunately people use them for many purposes. Um, this is a diagram that uh, people in uh, the office seem to think resembles a, some sort of reproductive diagram from uh, a biology class. But it's essentially showing how the, what you're essentially trying to construct is multiple different walls around the information you're trying to keep secret, such that it requires multiple different uh, uh, um, uh, techniques to get through and to penetrate it. And then even on the way out, there's also multiple different techniques so that it's not just an open door where information can come in and out. 
There's entire PhDs written on how this can be done. And we've worked with partners for over four years now. And much of the job has been trying to distill it down into something very, very simple. So this is about as simple as we've been using over the last three years. This is up for grabs. If somebody sees something here they, they think is wrong, uh, please tell us, as I said. Uh, but we start off with things along the lines of uh, what is the information you have and can it get somebody tortured or killed? You need to protect that and you need to put your resources into protecting that. After that, you've got financial impairment. You've got various other things which might cause you embarrassment, like the release of financial statements which would have been made public anyway. And then on the other side, you've got the, the various different actions that you can do. So it is okay to do nothing as long as you know you're doing nothing. And you need to start looking at um, how you fail because there are so many different ways to fail and most people fail in the worst possible way. So just try and fail a little bit less bad than everybody else and you'll be a little bit better than, than, than everybody else. And so this is the answer slide, and I don't want to throw, I'm only throwing this in here because uh, there's a lot of jargon in here, there's a lot of, uh, what, four letter acronyms and various other bits and bobs in here. So for example, password managers, two-factor authentication, VLANs and subnets to try and partition your network so nothing happens in any part of the network without some other part knowing about it. None of these are perfect, they're just little parts of that wall that you can construct around various different bits of information. Because as most people will say, um, perfect security is impossible. If you can read it, they can read it. Uh, and so I'll, I know I'm two minutes over, so I'm gonna wrap up here, that just make sure that you're, you're asking the right questions. Um, most people are too afraid to consider what their worst case scenario is because it's too awful to think about. Unfortunately, that's not necessarily I don't think you can do that. You have to think about it, you have to confront it, and because oftentimes the consequences will not necessarily be for you. They'll be for a source, they'll be for somebody who's trusted you, and if you're not gonna do it for yourself, maybe think about doing it for them. And once you've figured out what your worst case scenario is, or indeed your second worst case or third worst case, ask yourself the question, what are we doing to figure out if this has actually happened? Because most people don't know they've been hacked until 15 months after they've been hacked. What are you doing to prevent it from occurring? Or what are you doing when it does occur that you're failing well and you're not, that one flaw does not give somebody the keys to the kingdom? And ask yourself, given that there's somebody out there who potentially knows more, who are you gonna buy a pint for? Who is the person you think can help you go to the next level, give you one bit of information that you didn't have before, such that you can implement that in your system and hopefully make, protect the information that is the, the, the lifeblood of uh, journalists and indeed now the modern world. Um, and just for completeness, in case somebody said I gave a security talk without talking about SSL, VPN, Tor, PGP, there they all are at the very, very end, so nobody can tell me I didn't speak about them. Thank you very much. So. That's okay. Um, thank you very much. So um, now we come to um, some more real-world uh, examples of these methods. Um, I welcome Ibrahim Mohamud uh, from CAGE. And you can just take this out and this in, and it should work. Yours, so to say. I think the. Uh, it's, it's not working, it's not responding. Oh. Well, it worked. It's not responding. Well, no. oh. Are you sure it's still your computer? I mean, that's, that's exactly the problem. So, do you know that you have been hacked, or do you consider it normal your machine doesn't respond to you? And not everybody can distinguish that. It's responding okay. now. It must okay. be the. Uh, it must be me. Um, <laughs> um, so, hello. Um, I'm from CAGE. Um, my name is Ibrahim Mahmoud, and my colleague Kerry Bullivant is, 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 will be co-hosting this presentation, uh, so to speak. We're from the advocacy group CAGE, which campaigns against uh, state abuses in the war on terror and calls for the rule of law and due process. Um, and our presentation has taken a slight tangent a slight 
diversion, you could say. Uh, and uh, I, think, I think one of the best contributions that we could bring is actually to speak about something very recent we've been working on well, for a long time now, but becoming a lot more prevalent in our, in our context in the, in the UK. Um, so you, there you have some, I'm not going to be the most bizarre slide you've seen in your life, but that is a, a typical uh, industrial town in the UK. Uh, they're not always red, they have different colours as well. It's a series of terraced houses, um, you know, one next to another, for as, as far as I can see. And uh, for those of you who might have young children, you might have a 10-year-old boy or a girl who's asked to speak, write, draw about their house, to draw about their mum, their dad, their parents. Um, and that's something that's very ordinary. Um, but uh, being a Muslim in the UK, it's a lot more different if you get your spelling mistakes wrong. So there you have it. So the young man is trying to express himself as saying, I live in a terrace house, but due to bad spelling, and in my opinion, the Conservative government's really bad education policies, um, you have a young man saying, a terrace house. And there in lies a problem, something that we'd have seen on the internet as a meme, something you share around, and this is hilarious. In reality, you have a 10-year-old boy who's been traumatised by the idea of counterterrorism police come into his house, spending several hours interrogating the mother and the father and finding out who was the source of the radicalization, why is a 10-year-old Muslim boy in northern England talking about living in a terrorist house, you must be terrorists, and, and, that, and that's the hysteria uh, that many Muslims unfortunately uh, face uh, in the UK. And again, it's something that's genuinely unbelievable. It's hard to fathom that that could be the case, but it's something that's very prevalent. And you may be thinking, and again, you know, even the father, when asked about it, said, this is a joke. It must be a joke. I mean, how could, how could, he, how could he come to my house with, with several counterterrorism officers, the local authority, the school safeguarding officer, and all say that my son is, I'm the cause of radicalization for my son because he spelt terrorist house instead of terrorist house. And therein lies a problem with this particular strategy. Um, so the prevent strategy is a, is a means of the government uh, to essentially criminalise sport, very simply, as well. And what you're seeing is that the Muslim community is becoming a, a guinea pig community, a suspect community. Uh, so prevent is basically a, a policy that's been around for, uh, for nine, ten years now. It's aimed to stop um, the ideological threat of terrorism, to challenge the ideological threat of terrorism, to fight that and to challenge it. And the problem you have is that the government has passed legislation uh, very recently, for the last year or so, uh, to actually train every single public sector worker in the country to spot the signs of radicalization. And what they consider as training is a two-hour video with very little uh, Q&A, very little input. There's a, there's a manual, the trainer says, okay, I'm going to read this manual, I'm going to watch a video, and then you're trained. And if you see something, you just need to let us know. And that's the problem you have, a, to a topic that's very complicated, political violence, why it happens, why do people commit acts of violence, it's all been packaged into a two-hour takeaway and says, go away and learn, learn how to spot terrorists and come back to us. And that's irrational, it's just, and it's downright stupid. And what you're seeing is the referral rate is, is shockingly high. And so you, you, Prevent's been around since 2007, and it's been steadily increasing, but when the legal duty went up in 2015, look at the increase. And that's what happens when you make a legal duty. Beforehand, it was a policy, communities boycott it, they avoid it, they say it's a joke, it's racist, it's homophobic, we don't want to engage in this, it's a, it's a pseudoscience, right? But that's what happens when you, when you legally oblige somebody to actually take part in a hocus-pocus uh, uh, government program. And again, I mean, this young man, I met him very recently. Uh, he came to our offices, he said, look, I'm having some trouble here, I'm a master's student, um, studying terrorism, and for some reason, because of the book that I was issued on my reading list, I was accused of being a terrorist, and I need some assistance because I'm being referred on to this prevent program, because uh, I'm a so-called radical or a, an extremist. And uh, again, people just could not believe it. But these horror stories are just... In the UK, I mean, even today, you had a story that just came out in the BBC uh, regarding uh, a four-year-old boy who writes, who's drawing a picture of a cucumber and pronounces it as cookabomb because he's four. <laughs> and again, he's referred on to prevent because the parents are, could be the source of radicalization. Why is a four-year-old Muslim boy saying cookabomb? Why is he not saying cucumber and all the rest of it? And again, again, it's laughable, but it's, it's the trauma that you're finding in these young people and also adults as well who all face this, this sort of thing. And the irony is, whenever we speak about the prevent strategy, you'll always have the naysayers the, 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 and saying you're scaring people, you're try, you're, you, know, you're, you support terrorists, you're terrorist apologists, you are advocating the terrorist cause. And the problem is that 
we are seeing evidence, you know, and a steady rise of cases and a large number of documented cases, news stories every other day. And this is not scaremongering. This is reality that large sections of the community, Muslim communities in the UK genuinely feel concerned about when they speak about ideas, when they engage in conversation, when they make a human mishap or mistake because of, because of the fear of criminalization. So we started this work, we were one of the few organizations that spoke about this in 2007, way before anybody ever heard of it. We made it very clear that there's a clear attempt by the UK government to class people into good and bad camps. You're a good Muslim, you're a bad Muslim. You're a bad Muslim, you're a good Muslim. And this dichotomy is not helpful. It's not helpful, and, it's ba and again, it's based on an, a, 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 a flawed assumption. We'll probably go into that shortly. But coming back to the most uh, critical thing that we, part, we actually worked on on Prevent was this particular um, publication, Cradle to the Grave, the Prevent Strategy, how Prevent is now seeping into every single part of your life. You could be referred by your GP, your general practitioner, your doctor, you could be referred by the prison officer, you could be referred by a school teacher, and you could be even referred um, as, a, as a child. And, and that's the problem. It seeped into this... Uh, society and, and we've basically taken it apart and actually shown why Prevent is flawed, why it's not evidence-based. It's absolute pseudoscience. I can't stress that enough. And the irony is the government shrouds Prevent in secrecy. It refuses to engage in discussion. It refuses to re release its evidence. It refuses to release even the training. But yet again, we will keep on. We'll keep on. And as our, as our friend Julian mentioned when he launched the report, is that this is something that, all, this is, something that is, is, is used as a, as a, uh, pe a pet project. But let's try it in the Muslim community. Let's see if it works out. But sure enough, sooner or later, we will use terror legislation on every part of sexual society who dissents against government or who has a political ideals that go against the grain. So we started some, some efforts. We compiled a, a, an extensive signatory of 300 academics, MPs, ac activists, is basically saying that this stifles open debate, free speech, and political dissent. And the government is using the, 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 the threat of terrorism as a means of taking out people who dissent and they, who disagree with the government, essentially. And we've been on a, a, a real serious concerted effort to get this message out to the country, to speak in communities. I actually remember on a tour when we were going around the country, Blackburn, Sheffield, and other cities, the Daily Mail, the uh, respected publication in the UK. Uh, no, it really is, according to some people. Uh, you know, they accuse us of scaremongering. You're scaring people. You're making them fearful. You're making them look inwards. You're lying about prevent. This will never happen to prevent. It's absolute lies. But the evidence... Again, it's proved them wrong. And what you're seeing now is that prevent has now be the opposition towards prevent has become the norm. And when I say the norm, people were very acutely aware of prevent, but didn't really understand it, didn't really think it would impact them. Well, it's the, it's the dark colored people, it's the people who live in the, in the cities, it's the Muslims. You know, as long as you know, myself and my family are not impacted well, it's not really a problem. But there you see, that's a lack of solidarity. It's a lack of understanding as to what the, the true essence of counter legislation, what it tries to achieve. So here what we've done is try to submit, uh, you go through the usual process, let's find out the information, let's try and unravel and reveal what Prevent really is. So we submitted something called FOIs, they're Freedom of Information Requests. Now in the UK, uh, I mean, they, it, it, you, might, you might as well not bother, to be honest. I mean, they just don't really, sometimes they don't reply to you, sometimes they'll even refuse it on all kinds of spurious grounds. So we've had many people, ourselves, academics, journalists, have submitted hundreds, no joke, hundreds of FOIs, Freedom of Information Requests, asking to understand what on earth this strategy is about. And this is actually my favorite of them all. It's a very long reply from the Home Office. Um, but to put it very simply, for those of you who are not, not reading it, the, idea, the government has an idea that if we were to divulge the training or the information in regards to prevent, it will undermine the ability, it will undermine confidence in the community in the strategy, and actually, and terrorists themselves will know how to avoid being detected. But the irony is, if you speak to any prevent officer, if you speak to the Home Office, they will always say, prevent is not about spotting terrorists, it's about preventing terrorists, it's about making sure that we stop them from going on this pathway to violence. But again, the pseudoscience, as it says, just contradicts itself again and again and again. So what we said was, we're fed up of uh, waiting around and trying to get you to reveal your information, we just leak it. And we released recently, I think it was a month ago, we leaked the most extensive uh, training manuals on Prevent uh, in the history of the, of, of the strategy. In the, in the first time it's ever happened, you've got all these manuals, the videos, the trainings, all there, public scrutiny. And the Home Office, uh, despite having trained 350,000 people, have refused to divulge it for their concern of it undermining confidence and terrorists being spotted. So that's us taking a proactive action to say our communities will not 
not wait around for government to, to uh, understand or to come around or to change their mind. And we'll take action if need be. Uh, but again, this will come up. This all does. This doesn't come without any consequences. And some of the consequences, uh, like many people before mentioned, uh, are are difficult ones. Um, so, for example, after our report, Credit to the Grave, came out, which was a very comprehensive report looking at all spheres of prevent, um, our bank accounts were closed on, on March 2014. So we are operating in the feudal period, we could say, uh, on a cash-based bartering system. And that is still the case today. We actually do not have a bank account. No bank, no bank in the United Kingdom will give us a bank account. So we're all dealing with coins and cash as if it's some sort of medieval town. And that's the reality of what, of what happens um, when you decide to undermine, or not undermine, to scrutinize uh, the, the policies of, of government, which is a fair act for any democratic open health society to do so. And again, not only was it good enough for Cage to have their bank account, but two of our staff members have to have their bank accounts closed as well. And they're never allowed to have bank accounts, according to the, the banks. And even one of our board members uh, had the same thing. And the thing is, they won't, they won't even inform you at times. You'll have to find out on your own. There'll be no information. There's no reason as to why. Some, the bank manager may say, oh, I'm very sorry. So, well, I know you're very sorry, but that's not really helpful, is it? You know, so that's the reality of, again, uh, trying to open up and open to scrutiny what the prevent strategy is. And again, after the bank closure, you had a few months, you had the month prior, uh, our, our outreach director, Marazan Beg, who's a former Grand Summer detainee, he was arrested and held for eight months uh, on trumped up charges. And for those of you not aware of what he was arrested for, the idea that you can send a generator uh, to a, a war-torn country like Syria, when the UK government at the same time had sent 10,000 generators, that was considered a terrorist offence. And the irony was the day before his trial, he was released suddenly without no information to why, and yet he was held for eight months in the most high security facility in the UK. Again, that had taken direct action against members of CAGE staff, and that's him there walking out of HMP Belmarsh in South East London. And since then, he hasn't even got a passport. He, he's not allowed to travel. Uh, they won't even issue him a passport. And he's unable, to, he's unable to join you here today or to even take part in important investigation work uh, abroad. And then it wasn't enough for us to have no bank accounts, for, for our colleagues to be arrested, for our colleagues to have not be able to leave the country. But they then, would, obviously, the, uh, the good people in the tabloids uh, and the right-wing uh, media, uh, for some reason, pick a bone with Cage. So you have these sorts of headlines uh, that are produced. And I have to say to the good people at the Daily Mail, the idea that a six-month investigation uh, about people who are speaking at universities, openly invited by the university themselves or student societies, can be seen as fanatical or can be seen as, uh, you know, as, as zealots is laughable. And it actually shows the, the high quality that the Daily Mail has for itself. And this six-month investigation really uncovered nothing. There was nothing hateful, there's nothing illegal, there's nothing insightful. All we'll speak about is prevent. And what the state has done in the UK is very sophisticated. Don't bother, uh, it's not enough for the Prime Minister to label you. We need the press to then start to say these people are also very dodgy and very controversial. And the problem is, if you actually read the story, what is it that is criminal? What is it that is wrong? And that's the problem. There is nothing. And that was not only all. You had four, in four days alone, it was a very interesting four days. I mean, you had eight different newspapers, 28 different headlines, all saying the same thing. Uh, that cage is undermining counterterrorism policy. It's making our country more at risk. It is destroying the only thing that we have to save ourselves from the terrorists. And the problem is that the, the Home Office make it very clear that prevent is not about spotting terrorists. I mean, uh, it's about preventing people from becoming terrorists. So there's a whole, there's a whole contradiction in, in that sort of argument itself. And again, it just shows that there was a concerted effort to malign and to put pressure uh, on, the, on, on CAGE simply because it speaks on uh, the prevent strategy. And then, you, and, and then you have our dear Prime Minister who just pops on television every now and again and reminds the public about how nasty CAGE is and you shouldn't associate with them uh, as well. And the irony is, if you, uh, is that this kind of pressure is a multifaceted thing. It uses detention, it uses the press, and even politicians. And you have the, the, the lovely gang of eight, um, all of them, the, the, our Prime Minister, our, our Mayor of London, um, some other chats you may have heard of, um, the Secretary of State, uh, the, foreign, the Foreign Minister as well, the University Minister, the Northern Irish Secretary. It's always as if it's, it's just a, it's a regular thing in the UK now. You know, everyone's got to say they're two pence on cage. And it's actually quite funny that an organisation with no bank account, who is directed is regularly arrested, who can't leave the country, uh, with four staff, can get so much attention simply by talking about 
Why is Prevent secret? Why can't we talk about it? Why can't we challenge the ideas? Where's the evidential base? Where's your empiricism? This kind of uh, language is seen to be extreme. And that's the problem. How is it a small organization of four people can be uh, so important in the eyes of the, of, the, of the Gang of Eight? And then you have another group of people. And obviously from a UK context, but also I'm sure in other countries, you know, people generally, there's this understanding or convention that journalists and lawyers should have the right to go about their work without any, you know, sort of, you know, uh, harassment or intimidation or underhanded tactics. And what you're seeing now in the UK is a steady trend of the, of, of, of the counter-terrorism officers who are now saying to journalists, OK, we'll need to seize your laptops and your materials because we may have some materials in use in our investigation. And the problem is, I spoke to the uh, BBC about this, actually, um, and, I said, and, and I said to them, you know, well, what's happened here? You seem to have, uh, you know, allowed this to happen on your watch. And, uh, the problem, and, their, and their response is, well, there's nothing we can really do. We can't really report on it. The police have to do their job. And uh, that's the end of it as far as we're concerned. I think that's a problem where you have institutions like the press who have been attacked by using counter legislation, not willing to challenge it. Even this, the BBC Newsnight itself didn't report on it. It had the third party source, uh, the Independent, speaking about it. And also you have the case of David Miranda as well. Schedule 7, something that many 40,000, 50,000 people a year are stopped at a port for nine, up to nine hours, and you have none of these rights whatsoever. If you're stopped in the UK going for a port, you virtually, you know, you're stateless. You have virtually any, no rights whatsoever. And that is something that happens on a regular basis as well. And you're, now you're seeing that intrusion happening with journalists, with lawyers, who the government don't seem to, fa don't seem to fancy. And obviously, you know, sometimes we keep a scoreboard as to who's been stopped the most. Uh, I can say thank you, I've not been stopped so far, but you never know. Uh, but one of our colleagues up to 20 times has been stopped, and that's a problem. Uh, and also, I think it's really important to say that, you know, whatever begins with one community will eventually affect this entire society. And our work is to enable our community to gain a voice, to say that you can have dignity uh, and you can speak out if you think that something is wrong and you should organize. And again, we come back to this statement again. It's a really pertinent statement, I think. And I think it reflects the direction of travel that we're heading on as well. And finally, one thing I'd like to really end on is that your role. Many of you here have done some phenomenal work. And you know, I genuinely admire the work you've all done in all fields of life. But we, are only so, we can only basically do our job if we can collaborate, if we can team up. And I think there's a practical angle in terms of solidarity where it needs to be extended in a way where it empowers communities like ours to actually exert our voice and to actually hold a power to account. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for that, um, although um, it sounds like the UK understood, misunderstood 1984 as a manual and created the thought crime uh, policy that. already. <laughs> Unfortunately, they will not even tell us what the crimes are, so it's going to be tricky. Um, Jocelyn Reddick comes uh, from the other side uh, of the water and is a good proof that you can also come from a rather innocent environment to get in serious trouble. So, Jocelyn, the floor is yours. First of all, I wanted to thank the CIJ Logan Symposium and Der Spiegel for inviting me. Um, Jake stole most of my uh, best lines by using more colorful language uh, than I will hear, which I didn't think would be possible. Um, but you are all freedom fighters in all of your different ways. But to the US government, you are traitors, turncoats, and terrorist sympathizers. You're helping the terrorists. And I know this because I run Whisper, the whistleblower and source protection program at Exposed Facts. I, it means I represent whistleblowers and people who are like, oh, you mean like that Snowden guy? And I mean, that I do represent that Snowden guy. And other speakers here, like Thomas Drake, who might be in the audience, and Bill Binney, and some of my other clients who are in the audience who should not identify themselves. Um, <laughs> why do whistleblowers need protection, you might ask? After all, they are revealing fraud, waste, abuse, illegality, dangers to public health and safety. In fact, they have revealed every major scandal of my generation. You wouldn't know about it. You wouldn't know about 
torture. You wouldn't know about war crimes. You wouldn't know about secret surveillance um, if, if there were not whistleblowers involved in those stories. Um, yeah, these are the very people who are under attack. And that's not mere hyperbole on my part. They are literally under attack because the Obama administration, the hallmark of freedom and transparency, the most transparent administration ever, trademark that, they have brought a relentless fight on whistleblowers, prosecuting them under the Espionage Act, a hundred-year-old law that is meant to go after spies, not whistleblowers. In fact, the last time this law was dusted off and used against a whistleblower, it was against Daniel Ellsberg more than 40 years ago, the Pentagon Papers whistleblower. Yet our constitutional law president, whom I know most of you tend to admire as being the beacon of a free and open democratic society, has dusted off this law and used it to go after Tom Drake, Chelsea Manning, Jeffrey Sterling, John Kiriakou, uh, Stephen Kim, uh, who else? Uh, Hitzelberger, and of course, Edward Snowden, who you will hear from tomorrow. Um, and the problem with this law is that you can't raise a defense. It's something that we call a strict liability law. In other words, your motive is completely irrelevant. So whether you intended to sell secrets to our enemy for profit or reveal information to the public that the public has a right to know doesn't matter a bit and will not be heard by any jury. Moreover, most of the proceeding against you will transpire in secrecy. That's why you may not have heard of a number of the people that I mentioned, or you may have heard a little bit about them. Um, and I think the Espionage Act, by going after whistleblowers, it is a backdoor war on journalists. Because in every single indictment against a whistleblower, there are multiple journalists, journalist A, journalist B, journalist C, thinly disguised as wrote an article for the New York Times on warrantless wiretapping on this date. You know, and you can easily figure out who these journalists are. And they have been, the government has tried to call them as witnesses against their own sources, against the whistleblowers, most recently in the trial of Jeffrey Sterling, where um, a Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist, Jim Risen, was subpoenaed twice by the Bush administration, once by the Bush administration, and twice by the Obama administration to testify against a, an alleged source. Um, so this is very real, and I think it is also a backdoor way of creating an official Secrets Act, which our country has managed to live without for more than 220 years. Um, and that's how it's being used. And other laws that deserve equal scrutiny are the Computer Fraud Abuse Act. Um, that's one that was used against my, my late friend Aaron Schwartz, um, who's an internet activist. You know, another law that will not allow you to raise a proper defense. So these are draconian laws that are being used to go after people who speak truth to power. That's what they're guilty of. Um, and meanwhile, people who are accused of doing the exact same thing, allegedly mishandling classified or even unclassified information, are given sweetheart plea deals, like General David Petraeus, who leaked high-level uh, secret ops information to his mistress, and by Hillary Clinton, who's running for president of the United States. So if you are powerful or politically connected, you get a pass. But if you're unlucky enough to be an official, but not one high enough, um, you will literally face the rest of your life in jail. And short of having you know, your career killed and your name tarnished and all the other things attendant to being a whistleblower, short of death, spending the rest of your natural life in jail for doing something you thought was in the public interest is a really steep price to pay. Now, how to protect 
these people. Um, since I have gotten into this line of work, I myself was a whistleblower. When I blew the whistle at the Justice Department, I was put under the first federal criminal leak investigation. There's not really a crime called leaking in the US, by the way. I was referred to the licensing agencies in which I'm an attorney, and I was put on the no-fly list. Um, and I thought it couldn't get any worse than that. Um, but then when Obama used the Espionage Act and actually indicted someone, criminally went after them, I thought it was an anomaly. Now, there are numerous things I do in terms of protection of myself and of my clients. I never thought as an attorney, as an attorney, I'd have to go to such great measures to merely protect doing my work. I go through such gymnastics just to be able to do my job and communicate with my clients. Attorney client privilege, these you know, communications are supposed to be protected. Um, but there is no carve out by the National Security Agency of doctor patient communications or attorney client communications. And numerous attorneys who are doing human rights, like I do, find themselves have been subject to government monitoring. So basically, I've resorted to what my kids say are you using my drug dealer tactics. Not that they would know about that, but um, it, yeah, I don't like meet in person with my clients and pay in cash, um, use burner phones, that kind of thing. And then I got another client where I couldn't meet with them. Most of my clients are at the NSA, the CIA, so they're local to Washington, D.C. But then with Edward Snowden, we had a problem because he was stuck in the transit zone in Russia. Um, and we needed to be able to communicate safely. And I'm not going to talk about that means of communication. I think those means are well represented here by uh, a number of different groups. You know who you are, and you've, many, you've all spoken here, so thank you. Um, but it involves having multiple laptops on my computer, an air gap machine, and even then I can't, it's not like you can save conversations with your clients, so you would have to put them on a different computer and then sneaker net them over to another place for printing, and it's so much rigmarole, but it's so important. And on the other hand, when I try to get other attorneys to help me on cases, or if I try to loop in a journalist, none of them use encryption. In fact, a recent study by the Penn Center found that 75% of US journalists, including top journalists, um, Dana Priest, Jim Risen, I mean, uh, titans in US journalism do not use encryption. Um, a number, uh, yeah, most lawyers, I, I can't find a single lawyer, uh, maybe one who does. Um, other lawyers I've had to actually have encryption installed for them. Um, so this is a, a huge problem in terms of be, doing your work and being able to do it safely. Now, in terms of protecting a whistleblower, most of them come to me after they've blown the whistle and once they're in trouble with the US government. But for whistleblowers who are not, I'm too short to see the clock, there is no clock, okay. Um, for whistleblowers who um, have not blown the whistle, but they want to. It's, uh, I try to take them through proper internal channels if they're available. National security and intelligence whistleblowers have no whistleblower protection, zero. If you're a corporate whistleblower, you are far more protected than if you're a whistleblower in the CIA. If you're a whistleblower in the CIA, you can torture someone and be on a book tour like Jose Rodriguez right now and Michael Hayden. Right now, the guy who brought us all the surveillance uh, policies of the NSA. Um, but, it, but yes, I mean, with, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think of the best way to articulate this. Um, but basically, you don't have any avenues that can really, really assist you if you're a whistleblower and you want to go forward. So for example, with a bunch of drone whistleblowers who I did bring forward publicly, they had not been public before. The way we did it, a way to safely um, ensconce them was first of all to have them go together in a group. So we had four whistleblowers at one time. 
have them go together in connection, in conjunction with the documentary called Drone, which premiered, um, it premiered here in Berlin, it premiered um, in New York, have them go public because two of them were in that film. And then I didn't trust a single US newspaper to cover it, so I ended up contacting The Guardian, which I know Jake Applebaum hates, but um, I hate less than I probably hate The New York Times on, on issues of drones. Um, and, and, and they went public that way, and at the same time did a letter to Obama. And it's hard to argue with four guys who are in the program who are all saying the same thing, who don't independently know each other. Um, so there are ways to safeguard them. I have, there's another drone documentary that premiered here, National Bird. I was here about three weeks ago for the premiere of that, Sonia Kennebec's documentary. That's where another three drone whistleblowers I represent were able to go public, and it's going to premiere in the United States um, at, at a later date. Um, but again, that is a way. Whistleblowers going to the press, according to the US government, is not a valid way of blowing the whistle. And that's just completely, completely fabricated and made up. You have a First Amendment right to petition Congress for redress of grievances and to go to the press. But according to this administration, you don't. Um, anyway, I'm being told to wrap it up. Unlike the Oscars, we don't have the music playing to shoo me off, um, but I, I will shoo myself. So thank you so much um, for listening and hearing from me, and I hope you have a lot of good questions. Thanks. Thank you very much. So the idea, of course, to uh, wrap up here is that we have enough time for discussions. Um, um, so the next speaker is Marcel Rosenbach from the Spiegel, um, who better introduce himself. But um, uh, I think it's fair to say that he, from a professional point of view, uh, has to deal with protecting sources and ensuring operational security for quite some time now. And um, he's here to share his experience on that. Well, yes, I don't think there's much more to say. Good afternoon. Uh, Marcel Rosenbach. Uh, I work uh, at Der Spiegel since uh, 2001. And basically what I like to do uh, after hearing so many great stories and great investigations from great colleagues uh, earlier on today, I want to speak about some bad mistakes. Bad mistakes on my part. Uh, failures and uh, bad experiences. But before I come to that, um, before I come to the mistake part, um, I want to talk briefly about the, uh, yeah, if you will, the threat landscape we're in. Uh, Justin, you just mentioned, um, <clears throat> of course, the state-sponsored surveillance uh, sphere we're living in, we're working under, we have to be aware of as journalists, and uh, we have been covering uh, uh, the Snowden documents for, for uh, practically since summer 2013, so what we've seen there was pretty scary, and basically, um, as an outlet that promises source protection pretty much since its founding days in the 1940s. So we really are established legacy mainstream media <laughs> at Der Spiegel. Um, you actually uh, have to be aware, and uh, I didn't think it could get much scarier, but uh, if you think about it, what has really changed in the last couple of years is that actually um, only several years ago, uh, practically only states actually could afford powerful tools for surveillance. Uh, if you think about uh, things called an, an IMSI catcher, that would be a tool in the six figures, and companies that would offer it would only offer it to nation states. Uh, to be honest, that doesn't have to be a good message because any authoritarian state, of course, as you know, there are many examples, could get one of those. But that was the world we are living in. Uh, in for uh, uh, decades. Nowadays, uh, spy gear obviously is easily obtainable everywhere. It's getting cheaper and cheaper, and even easy to use. Uh, for instance, I was just talking about the IMSI catcher. If you go on the web, uh, you could shop one, 
Uh, I, this is just an example. You can look for IMSI catcher. You can, can look for uh, GSM uh, interception, GSM interceptor. This is just one example from, from yesterday from a big platform uh, in China. It sells for, will ship for 40 to 50 dollars. This is for phone calls. Uh, this is for your endpoint device, for your computer. Uh, if you look up a keylogger, I guess in this audience everybody knows what a keylogger is. It basically um, records any strike you do on the keyboard, be it a password, be it an email, be it an email to your source, uh, uh, for instance, um, or to your colleagues. And again, you can shop one. You see the prices are going from, from uh, 60 euros uh, upwards. You have a very, very powerful spying and surveillance tool. Basically, the same goes for Bluetooth. This is the Ubertooth um, for Bluetooth devices. Here you have something for your Wi-Fi connection. I hope everybody feels confident to use the open Wi-Fi here with a nice uh, uh, password. This is something you could use to play a little bit uh, here in the premises. So having said that, you can say, of course, OK, the tools are getting cheaper and cheaper. They are very accessible. But come on, you know, we are journalists. We're not that interesting. Bad mistake is not about us, of course. Uh, First of all, we have something to hide, which is our work, our projects, our documents. But of course, above all, we have something to protect, not something, but somebody, uh, meaning our sources, of course. So who could be interested? Uh, it goes without saying uh, uh, the first couple of things, but you know, not only nation states, not only uh, cyber criminals, but perhaps companies that are you know, a uh, subject of our reporting could be interested, institutions as well, individuals and uh, actually even colleagues, as uh, my uh, colleagues from the Tageszeitung here in Berlin know, because they actually experienced this here on their computers, and uh, I think the investigation is still pending, but obviously it was one of their colleagues deploying keyloggers in a German newsroom against his fellow colleagues. So, is this all real life or just fantasy? Many of you are so young, I don't know if you know the, the line from Bohemian uh, Rhapsody from, from Queen. I just talked about the newsroom uh, at Hutz, um, but um, I will now come to what I have uh, uh, speaking earlier as a mistake or uh, perhaps lack of knowledge on my part. Uh, I have to say <laughs> it's several years ago. <coughs> Happened in the mid of uh, 2000s. And it was a nightmare for me because it was a story I did for the Spiegel um, on companies selling surveying gear, surveillance gear, sorry. And um, I did what every journalist would do. I tried to harvest open source intelligence on them on the web and of course on their websites as well. So I went for their business reports, I went for the bios of their managers, so everything what you expect, what you would do yourself. And finally, I decided uh, to call them. There was one telephone number, it was not a very big company, and the response I got on the phone after introducing myself was exactly that sentence. Oh yeah, we expected your call and we know what you're up to. Which actually, at that time came to a big surprise, and I think it took like, like several seconds until I swallowed. And I said, oh, well, uh, that's interesting. Uh, uh, yeah, please, please tell me what I'm up to. Uh, I'm a bit confused. And actually, the good thing basically was that I had not a professional PR person and not a professional manager on the other side, but somebody who was very, very proud what their server could lock, and what their admin could read from the server locks. <laughs> so that was, actually, that was actually, for me, a moment when I thought, huh, well, what's the problem here? And the, the reason and the problem, of course, was this. We, as a company, had this fixed IP, which is as good as a, as a card, actually. Um, where you can see Spiegel Verlag, Rudolf Augstein, the IP details. The only thing that tricked them actually was that all our traffic is going out of Hamburg and I was working from Berlin, but that didn't help, of course. That was uh, uh, basically the only thing. The lesson learned 
from that early mistake is pretty obvious, and uh, I don't think I have to, to, uh, to, to, to mention it here in this audience. There's only some examples you can easily avoid that kind of situation, that kind uh, of mistake as a journalist, um, and they're pretty well known right uh, now in many newsrooms, not in all of them, actually, so I, I tend to... to, to give classes in, in journalism schools, and supply, surprisingly, not only in schools, but uh, for, for unions, journalism unions, um, and I have the same experience, of course, still, although I have to say that things have changed, especially after Snowden, when it comes uh, to encryption, and when it comes to, to anonymizing uh, uh, own IP traffic, uh, things have changed, but uh, I think the number would be even lower in, in Germany than it is in the US, still. A very bad experience, probably the worst experience, the worst experience you can actually have as a journalist. Uh, but uh, I have to explain what happened before. <clears throat> I was doing a story on, a, on another corporation, actually, a German uh, company, and uh, same thing. I was doing my work. <coughs> And, uh, but I forgot to think about something uh, doing my work. Um, it was a controversial story about that company, and uh, it ran, and I got two calls. The first call was, again, from a PR person in, in a very boasting manner with that sentence, which is a nightmare, of course, we know your source. The second call was even worse for me because it was from somebody within the company who was not my source, but said to me, hey, come on, do you know in what trouble you brought me? It's a nightmare, I can lose my job. And I had no idea what was going on, really no idea. He told me that he was actually called to the legal department, he had to sign papers, that he did not have contact with me, that he didn't hand over documents to me, which is actually, it was a pretty threatening situation for him. He was actually uh, threatened to, to be fired. And I said, I have no idea. He asked me, did you mention my name somewhere? I said, you were not my source, why should I mention your name? It's crazy. How, how, how do you come up with that idea? And uh, actually, the situation got worse because another colleague of him got the same treatment within the company. And that was the moment when I learned about the second person that I said, wait a minute, I know both of the guys, I know them from long ago, how is that connection possible? How is that connection being made? And the answer is pretty simple. And it's about a very uh, powerful, uh, yeah, very powerful spying tool you actually uh, spoke about, uh, MC. It's the social web. And as a journalist working in investigative journalism, controversial journalism, actually um, you have to be very aware uh, what you use, who you invite, who you confirm, in what time frame. My problem in that particular case was uh, a, a nice tool, the six degrees of separation thing, because both of the names were in my contact list in one of the services. I knew them from way before that. They had nothing to do with the story, but their employer checked me out and saw that two of his employees actually were in contact with me, according to one of the services here, and uh, they ran into a problem. So, the solution for this is not that easy because, of course, there's the radical approach, which, which is not feasible for a, a, a journalist <coughs> um, because you actually, the tools are very helpful in your world, uh, work, of course, because uh, uh, what you just said is completely uh, uh, valid, of course, and we try to use open source intelligence like this as much as we can. So staying completely away is not a solution, uh, but a more realistic approach can be be very aware of the problem and try to not confirm or befriend sources while working on projects. Because actually that's what I see, and I'm sharing a little secret here. If I, of course, see a colleague um, befriending or, uh, you know, coming, becoming contacts on LinkedIn with a certain set of people in a, in a short time frame, I know what he's working on. 
So the same goes, of course, with uh, Foursquare, Swarm app, and uh, things like that. So I'm being told to be quick. So the biggest thing of all uh, uh, in, the, in the newsroom, of course, is the topic of awareness. I just said so things have changed a little. Those are basic things. I don't have to. Uh, I don't think uh, I have to talk about it at length. Use encryption. Uh, uh, I know many people uh, that have doubts, especially uh, since we we uh, wrote about bull run and learned about bull run. Um, but uh, as you know, there's a credible source uh, uh, who tells us that encryption still works. <clears throat> So we try to do it, we try to offer it. We have a big problem with people approaching us uh, without a first contact, uh, sending us documents right from their office. Uh, so we try to actually educate them on our website not to do that, uh, to avoid that. And to end on a positive note, yes, the awareness in newsrooms obviously is rising. You won't hear it <laughs> with a smile. You just mentioned the New York Times, but they've just... Uh, actually hired a director of information security for the newsrooms. Uh, many of them, uh, many of you will know her. And uh, so uh, I think uh, that's the positive note and some lessons have been learned, uh, not only at the Spiegel. Thank you. So we have roughly 50 minutes left, and I think we had a quite a spectrum of contributions. How to fuck it up, how to realize you fucked it up, how to avoid breaking the law. Um, the even more difficult question, how to avoid breaking the law if the law is not transparent uh, explained to you. Um, so there seems to be quite some bandwidth of things. I found two questions very challenging. Um, the one was, from Jesslyn, so how do we provide an environment or without um, encouraging people to break the law all too obvious, but how do we provide an environment where whistleblowers, before they maybe blow the whistle, before they are already in the trouble of non-preparing, how can we provide them helpful methods um, to whatever they do in the public interest to do it in a way that uh, they can at least finish their job before um, hell breaks over. Um, so that's a question to all of you a little bit, or at least main important maybe to Jesslyn and to MC and to Richard, um, which I would first like to have here a little bit. I, I mean, I would say, look me up on the internet. It's, <laughs> I'm easy to find. I am. And um, if I'm not the one who can handle your case, I can refer you to someone else who can be mm. able to help. Um, but also, if you're someone thinking of blowing the whistle, if you're in the U.S., use SecureDrop, which is a number of newsrooms have implemented so people can send documents encrypted um, and, and not get caught. Okay. Richard, do you have a quick... Yeah, I think the, the, probably the best thing is the, the examples that have been set before and the procedures that have been in place from experience about how somebody... Uh, is now not uh, in jail for potentially 25 years and in Russia that, that um, supposedly ending your life is now not necessarily a consequence albeit a different life and I think in future hopefully better results can, can occur such that it isn't just a complete um, write-off of the person's life but uh, certainly the examples that have been said and the experiences learned by uh, lawyers and people like that to, to get people out safely. So MC, you have any additional thoughts on? I think a lot of it's just being aware of the data trails that you're leaving as well as the capabilities of your employer or whoever you're blowing the whistle on to investigate those and motivations that they would have to do that. Okay. So and, and to Ibrahim and Marcel, I have a difficult question and that also goes to the audience and with this question I want to encourage you also to, to provide some answers or additional questions. So, MC, I think you, you gave a very inspiring thought at the end of your presentation, saying that we should, you know, get the information on the table and then review our options. So, um, I mean, um, some of these uh, information we do have on the table, but I'm not sure we have really made the assessments of the options. So, so that's a question to you, Ibrahim, but maybe also to you, MC and Marcel. 
So are we already using or reviewing all our options to deal with these people who decrease our options ourselves? So do we maybe need a better network between law, lawyers who, who fight for enforcing rights and journalists? Or what's, what's our way of dealing it next to exposing the fact that's what's going on? So. Um. From Cage's perspective, one of the things that we're very keen to do is work with journalists to get the information that we have out there. We have a, a wealth of primary source information um, and many people on a daily basis coming forward to, to us. Um, sort of tying into your previous question, Cage is a grassroots organization. One of the things that we've done in the past with, uh, with uh, things like Prevent that we were talking about and one of the things that we're going to be doing in the future is going out and, and uh, doing InfoSec in the community at the grassroots level so that ordinary people can learn about this sort of stuff as well because when your children can be taken away uh, from you because of websites that you're potentially viewing for completely benign reasons, you have a, a right to know that you can protect yourself from those sorts of things. So um, we're always looking for partners, especially in the UK, um, to, to work with on those sorts of grassroots level, but also uh, media organisations that are, uh, are willing to, to basically put their balls on the table and, and go out there as well. Um, Cage are taking the heat on a lot of this stuff. And we need media partners that are willing to take that heat with us. Yeah, I mean, if I could add something to that. Unfortunately, in the US at least, there's an unhealthy tension between journalists and whistleblowers. And I've been having meetings between the two to try to bridge that gap and figure out why that is, because they're perfectly happy to report without any further investigation anyone from the government says, but with the whistleblower, they want 10 people to corroborate it, which is often just not possible. And they view whistleblowers as a little weird. They're out for fame or revenge or d disgruntlement or whatever. Um, and that, that divide needs to be bridged. Another problem with journalists on that side is they're perfectly happy to take information from a whistleblower. But when the government turns around and retaliates against a whistleblower in pretty outrageous ways, they won't write a story because the retaliation is not newsworthy. Mm -hmm. That is news. That's pretty hardcore, yeah. But, um, so, MC, you had another thought on your... So one thing that I've seen is that there's not a whole lot of coordinated effort between groups. There's not a lot of coordinated effort between journalists and lawyers and technologists and whistleblowers, and that's changing a bit, but there's still problems like lawyers not using encryption and not enough technologists working with journalists and this problem with whistleblowers. I think there's a lot of distrust actually between these groups and a lot of competition even with amongst journalists and other things, and I think this is quite problematic. And I think part of this is due to competition, part of this is due to people having different ways of approaching problems and different ways of affecting the world and not fully understanding the means of the others. But I would like to see more coordinated effort because right now I see a lot of people doing a really good job with their one little piece of things, but everything falling apart and it not accomplishing anything at all because they're not working with other people. And I'm not sure the best way to encourage that, but I think that's <laughs> probably the key because without that, everything's worthless. And that's maybe also an excellent question to the audience. How can we bring journalists to cooperate with each other in the public interest? I've also many times sitting in between chairs of groups of journalists who I try to bring together, but I found that they don't like to work together or share their research. Oh, God, what a, what a thought. So is there anyone from the audience who has any... <coughs> and maybe someone can switch on your microphone. <laughs> Hello? Yeah. Shall we gather some questions and remarks from the audience, yeah? Yes. Please, I, I go from the back to the front. So, anyone wants to say something? So, there's no thought police here. There's no thought crimes to, meet, to be committed here. Feel free to... Or, or, or was it... Well, I think it's... Okay. I think it's um, live stream though, so. <laughs> Here's a question or yes, remark. please. Hi, my name is Jane Wyatt from the European Centre for Press and Media Freedom in Leipzig, Germany. Uh, we do what it says on the label with a Centre for Press and Media Freedom. We have two encrypted reporting points on our website, ecpmf.eu. 
EU. We use PGP, uh, one specially for women that was launched this week on the 8th of March, International Women's Day, and one is for any journalist under threat anywhere. Um, so I have two questions. Uh, is PGP good enough? Is it recognised? Are we doing the right thing there? And how can we um, not only reach out to journalists, but also put them in touch with the lawyers who are in our network as well, and maybe to people in the technology communities? Okay. I mean, on the first thing, we could roughly comment that with PGP, you do not protect the metadata. So who talks to whom? That's still obvious, and that's often, um, unfortunately, good enough to bring someone into real trouble. Um, your Shall other... we first, first get more questions, Andy? Yes, maybe. Well, I was just going to say Which, that, that, yeah, that maybe. the PGP is one, mm. potentially one component mm. of an overall uh, strategy where you're trying to protect information at various different points. So over the last few years, I've seen many groups using PGP actually quite well when they're communicating in, with sources and potentially using random Gmail accounts or something like that, but then they get the information and they stick it on Dropbox, <laughs> or they get the information and it's, it's and, and yeah. it's, but, uh, but I, and I'm not saying that to, 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 to kind yeah. of, okay. they just don't know because they don't, they're not, they, they see PGP as the be all and end all, yeah. as opposed to it being part of a, a series of questions that need yeah. to be asked. Yeah, I think we have to cut this yep. question a little bit out, and I would suggest the lady yep. uh, talks with Richard and, and maybe <coughs> Lisa. Yes, question here. Yes. Uh, hello. Um, I've been reading several stories of whistle whistleblowers, and for me, as a not journalist, it seems there is a lack of a, um, knowledge of an exit strategy for whistleblowers. Like Snowden ended up in Hong Kong and did not know where to go, and this seems pretty familiar with other whistleblowers, so how important is it to uh, prepare a whistleblower for his potential life after he blows the whistle, and what he should do? I mean, that's an excellent question, but it, I think, I'm not sure we can I answer can that. Yeah, maybe, maybe I mean, normally, the, the, you wouldn't need an exit strategy, because the worst, th the worst that could happen is you would get fired. That all has changed now, as we know, and I would say it depends on the quantity and quality of what you're exposing and how much it's gonna piss off the relevant governments. And talk about it with a lawyer, there are plenty of other exit strategies that don't involve being, most of my clients are not living in exile and most of them are free. But it's maybe also fair to say sure. that WikiLeaks redefined source protection. For they most did. media organization, it just means to not name the source while WikiLeaks, I mean, Sarah Harrison, risk her own life and situation to protect that source, and at least they got exactly. into Exactly, and Sarah is so. running the Courage Foundation to yeah. encourage people to be able to blow the whistle and do so safely, and help Snowden. So there would be another model besides the Chelsea Manning model of being in jail for 35 years, so. Yeah. So it's maybe, maybe it's also about the general uh, lack of redefining source protection, but mm -hmm. okay, I next agree. question. Oh, just in case there is one. Is there another question or remark from anyone? Or an answer to the question on what, what are the options? So yes. we are also looking for some inspirations here. Mm -hmm. What are the there. options? Here. Ah, cool. Um, okay, hi. My name is Greta. Um, I don't really have a an answer, but uh, um, I think that uh, whistleblowing would uh, strongly benefit from uh, experiencing direct contact with other whistleblowers as well, even before uh, blowing the whistle or going public, because uh, um, contact with the lawyers or journalists can be useful for legal protection or uh, uh, how to handle the, the, the material, the publication, okay. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, some maybe talking with uh, other people with similar situations or experience could be, uh, could allow for a sort of sharing of tips or, or uh, ha handling the tension or the threats uh, also, on, also from a human point of view, uh, for example, we have seen that with the Chelsea Manning, she was tricked by Ajahn Lamu because she needed someone to talk. Mm -hmm. And I think that happens because blowing the whistle is uh, somehow a lonely path. You feel alone, you feel the pressures, you cannot talk with the, your colleagues because they would 
probably report you to the government or something. So uh, I think that what uh, Jocelyn Radak did with the drone whistleblowers for drone whistleblowers is good because uh, they, they weren't alone. Uh, they had the possibility to talk and I think that this could be replicated in other cases. And concerning the uh, anonymity pro problem, for, for example, sometimes uh, whistleblowers don't want to go public, don't want to uh, have other people even out of whistleblowers to know their names. So this process of sharing uh, of uh, experiences could be done. If I, in if I can interrupt, the, that's a, I mean, you're making no, an sure. excellent, excellent point. And I never would have thought that my clients would turn into like speakers on the, on the international stage. But Tom Drake and Bill Binney and myself, we went all around the world uh, yes. with Exposed Facts Stand Up for Truth Tour and with Dan Ellsberg. Uh, you know, do that because I believe courage is contagious. And more and more whistleblowers, including Chelsea, from jail is willing to speak out about whistleblowing. So hopefully, and I always try to introduce whistleblowers to other whistleblowers because it is very isolating. Can I uh, maybe ask a last question to the cage uh, guys? Um, you're talking a lot about people who don't have the heroism, who don't have the press, who don't have journalist friends. So how do people persevere? How do they endure? You have only two minutes to answer. Yeah, well, <laughs> Great question, right? <laughs> you can both no answer from different perspectives. I mean, from, I mean my, my role at Cage is basically handling the relation between the journalist and the source. And I think one thing that really concerns me, and I'm, the reason why I focus on the UK context, because I see it being rolled out across the world, that they, all these really horrible examples of what, what the state does and also what certain media organizations mm -hmm. enact have been replicated in Europe and North America and even in countries you wouldn't believe in. I think the concern that we have is that there's a lack of protection for the source. So there's really two really shocking examples. Number one, the example of a man who's giving interview live on television. The moment the interview ends, the police are waiting to arrest him because they feel that he has evidence relevant to a case. Now again, you'd be surprised, and the stats that you gave in particular, the numbers of journalists who don't encrypt, are, it's true. In the UK context, I know very senior reporters personally who don't have a clue about encryption. Mm -hmm. they, they think PGP is a three-letter word that means something else. I mean, they don't understand that. Obviously, I'm not saying it's, it's the be-all and end-all, but even basic encryption like that, and also basic source protection. The other thing I wanted to mention, in terms of, uh, I mean, I'm not fully handed over about the clients, an issue of source protection is that it's really important to mention that even the journalists themselves, I mean, they've been told by their media organizations in terms of legal advice, if the coppers think that you have something of interest, you, we can't stand by, we can't protect you. It's, it's a legal issue now. We're not going to basically stand up for you. And I think a lot of journalists who work in the field of counterterrorism or, or terrorism and all the rest of it, they need to be a lot more aware that they are taking a bigger risk than they think that their corporation will back them. Uh, with, re with regards to people having strength and standing, I think much like what you were saying about um, whistleblowers, that comes from solidarity. Um, one of the things that identifies CAGE as, as a different organisation to so many others that are out there and working in, in this field is that it primarily um, takes a, a lead from survivors of the war on terror, people who have been affected by terrorism legislation. Um, and it connects them up together and it puts them uh, at, the, at the heart of the decision-making process for the way that the organisation moves forward. And that's part of empowering people and that's part of empowering our community. I myself was held under a control order for two years on the basis of secret courts and secret evidence. Um, to this day I was found innocent, but I still don't know what I was found innocent of. Um, and yeah, it, 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 it's insane. It's absolutely mad. But the, the coming in and working with Cage was kind of my therapy to get over that period. Um, and I, I, I assume it's very similar for some of your whistleblowers, I'm guessing. So thank you very much. I don't want to enter the discussion, but I suggest we uh, move it to the tea and coffee area. There's biological input and output options available. <laughs> and the next session starts in 30 minutes. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>